when I was very young, and way too young to remember, my mum says that my life was saved by my grandfather's dog called Rex. Rex was a working dog. If he'd had a job description, it would have read something like farm surveillance. Rex and my grandfather went everywhere together. He was his eyes and ears, but my grandfather was not a sentimental man. And if he'd asked him why he was so fond of this animal, he would have told you it was because he was a good working tool. In other words, a kind of technology. And it was beyond Rex's description of his job criteria for him to then come and save me from drowning in a sheep dip when I got knocked in by a flock of scattering sheep. And he behaved in a way that was unpredictable and yet very flexible, and of course for which I'm very, very grateful. Rex and my grandfather are now long gone. And farm surveillance nowadays is carried out by, ooh, one of those, um, a surveillance camera. Uh, based on digital parts and mechanical engineering. And it's something that we'd more conventionally think of as being a technology. But it has not escaped my attention that a device like the surveillance camera, if it observed a child in trouble, would actually not have the capacity to intervene. So when I tell you about my research, I just want you to think about those qualities that Rex and other living systems possess that are unique to living systems. And that is the capacity to, to cope with unpredictability and the material flexibility to respond. Because those are the qualities that I'm actually seeking in a very literal way in the research that I'm doing. And the technology that I want to apply them to is architecture. Now you may not think of architecture as being a technology, but I consider it as being a technology of environments. And we're very familiar with the internal environment of architecture. I mean, architecture's first function was to create a synthetic skin around us, to keep out the hostile elements, and to create a safe physiological space with very, very limited parameters. And this has actually dictated the choice of materials that we've used in architectural practice ever since. Essentially, they're inert, they are durable, and they're completely belligerent to the outside environment. But of course, our architecture has an outward <coughs> interface with the rest of the world. And this is an, a, a part of the technology that I think is really, really, really underdeveloped. In fact, it's very undeveloped. And this is the site where I think it, there is a huge potential for the future of architecture as a form of environmental technology. But we've, we've not used this interface. I mean, it's, it's one that potentially we could connect with um, nature to, you know, and actually really have a dialogue with the in environment, you know, tune our activities, you know, through our artificial um, technologies uh, with, and with, the, with the natural ones that are happening, create some kind of uh, holistic engagement between our constructs and, and the environments around us. But this hasn't happened. And that's partly because of the historical reasons that I've just spoken about, and partly because of some technological ones that I'll actually go into a little bit further. Now, architects throughout the ages, this is kind of running away on me, um, um, architects throughout the ages have actually used biology um, in, as, as a design inspiration. And in an urban context, Biology has many limitations. So what we've got in... I'm just trying to go back here. OK, so, so there are the living root bridges of Cherrapunji. And this is a biological system that is actually the architecture itself. I mean, the living root bridges of Cherrapunji, they span over 30 metres. They take 15 years to build and can take the weight over 50 people. So you can see that in an urban developed context, our biological systems are actually ill-suited Ill for an industrial context. And so architects throughout the ages have tried to find ways to work with the durability and consistency of traditional materials and yet find some way of approaching those unpredictable and unique qualities that biological systems have. And the first architect, I would say, to work with um, a kind of hybrid form of construction 
was Antonio Gaudi. And Antonio, Antonio Gaudi, in my opinion, um, used the chemistry of materials together with the physics of gravity to create his living forms. And these, these living forms really are, are organic styled structures through which this um, hallmark architecture that Gaudi produced um, and, and, and has been um, you know, copied by designers you know, over, over, over the last century. And, and essentially what Gaudi did was, um, in, in uh, his original architectures like this one, La Sagrada Familia, he was able to um, take clay and suspend it in hanging cloths and use this, this chemistry of, of the material itself and shaped through this process of gravity to then create these primordial forms that he assembled from a bottom-up perspective uh, and created architectures that were very individual and, and none of them are, are, are the same. And in a more contemporary setting, we've actually got another way of creating a bottom-up kind of architecture. And um, that is through um, Roger Hjorns's um, investigation of self-assembling molecular systems. Um, and um, what Roger Hjorns does is he uses the self-assembling properties of, of chemical uh, crystals. And he's done a, an installation called Seizure. <laughs> So his, his um, installation seizure is, takes place in this um, derelict environment. This is a, a, a building that's been condemned. And he encased it in um, stainless steel and he filled it up with um, supersaturated boiling copper two, sulfate, uh, so, copper two sulfate solution. And he left it for two weeks. And in that time, you get this unique interior created by self-assembly um, in this um, beautiful um, uh, building interior. So essentially, you know, once we've actually identified drivers of biology as being based in physics and chemistry <coughs> rather than <coughs> mathematics, which is what um, our book, Mr. Fuller, was doing, um, we can actually think about ways of constructing alternative biological uh, materials. Um, so architects, of course, in a contemporary setting, have imagined what this might be. And so we've got um, Matthias Holwich and Mark Kushner um, in their tri Metropolis um, project that are speculating about what it might be like when plants can actually provide the energy systems for, for um, uh, cities. Uh, we have others that um, imagine skyscrapers that sway in the breeze like reeds and others that imagine houses that can shake the snow from their roofs like Rex might shake the wet from his fur. But how much of this is a fantasy? You know, how much of this is a design aspiration by, um, by, by architects? Um, and how much of this is a material reality? Well, there's good news in that there's a new group of technologies that are emerging at the moment called living technology. The definitions of these are still ill-defined. Um, but essentially, they have some of the properties of living systems but are not considered to be alive. And I work with a system called the protocell. Now, the protocell is a chemically programmable agent based on the chemistry of oil and water. And essentially, it conducts itself in a way that can only be described as living. Now, you just see on the, um, uh, on, on the screen here a protocell in the process of a chemical form of computation. So what you have is the oil and water droplet system. The agent itself is a little circular protocell, which you can just see towards the top of the screen. It has an internal chemical program. It compares this with chemistry that's happening in the environment. And it makes a calculation, and the outcome of which can be of a number of different things. It can move. It can sense its environment. It can actually find its way to chemical gradients. And it can undergo a set of complex reactions. And some of these are architectural, like these crystal structures that are actually being autonomously built by the system. Protocells can also communicate with each other. In that case, they've just fused. But they can also act in a population way. And we'll see that in, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, but essentially, these, these chemicals have some context and dependency on their interactions with the nature of the environment in which they're placed. In some ways, we can describe them as environmental sensors because they do not have any DNA. So classically, unlike the way that we normally think about programming, we don't actually have a hierarchical set of instructions 
through which these complex behaviours are taking place. Now I'll just say that these really are just oil and water droplet systems and the oil water interface absolutely powers the entire reaction that you're seeing here. And you can see also that the morphology of these protocells is not fixed. There's actually a gentleman called um, Donald Williamson who actually says that he can um, explain the Cambrian explosion by having a less differentiated set of organisms that are able to swap body parts. And in my observations, these protocells can take on a variety of different forms you know, related to the pre-Cambrian organisms, which are all very soft-bodied, very much like these um, protocells. <coughs> And you can see that they can go through different phases, such as worm-like structures, jellyfish structures, um, and um, you know, polypoid structures. That there's a, there's a huge um, variety of, of different forms that these agents can take on. Um, and here you start seeing the, the population scale basis for this interaction. And in fact, what I'm going to do is just going to talk you through the, 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 the next sequence as well, because I, I, think, we'll, um, I, I think it's actually wor one worth exploring. Um, so here again, we, so these, the protocells, although they're just oil and water droplet systems, for some reason they're very social. We can't actually explain this in classical physics and chemistry. This is my favourite movie clip of all time. This is a, two sets of protocells. There's one population here that's in the centre of the picture and it's actually growing um, a, a microscopic architecture. The scale of this is they're all about a, a millimetre um, in, in diameter. This stable group of protocells is now being met by invaders, call them two football teams. So, so your, your, your two, your two um, uh, visitors have come to examine or, or have some kind of conversation with the, with the native team and that phenomenon there of the, the two populations um, separating and creating physical trails is something that we actually cannot explain. There is no programming that is purely the results of physical chemistry. So this system is inherently programmable and what I've been doing is I've been trying to program it to change the materials that can be produced by the system. So I've generated a general programming language and this one can produce carbonate shells. Um, so I've called these colloquially protopiles. We're actually in the process of a 10-year program that won't, won't just produce calcium carbonate, but we also hope as a side effect of this um, uh, computation that we'll also be able to produce fuel. Now, the question comes in an architectural context. Why on earth would you want to use these kinds of materials, these living materials? You know, we've got perfectly good concrete. <coughs> it's a reasonable question. Um, but if you go back to the beginning of the talk, I told you the story about Rex for, for a reason. And the reason is that we don't have materials right now that in themselves can cope with unpredictability. And they don't have the flexibility that, that we would like them to have to, to, to cope with a whole range of different environments. And of course, in an architectural context, this unpredictability comes as climate change. And of course, no city um, other than the iconic uh, uh, city of Venice is more affected, or the, the story that we know more about the precarious um, nature of existence um, than the city of Venice. And um, as an architectural project, we speculated on how the protocell may help us give us one set of new strategies through which we could perhaps uh, equip Venice with the, uh, a, a way of surviving, engaging in this um, survival of the, of the fittest in a very Darwinian way. So here are the protocells that we would introduce into the canals. We would actually make them light responsive and not like the light, so they didn't produce their product in the light-filled canals. Um, and here you can see that they also secrete um, their um, uh, calcium carbonate shells. So they make their way underneath the wood piles which support the city where they deposit their calcium carbonate <coughs> shells and gradually over time through accretion um, and crystallization um, they produce a, an artificial limestone reef underneath the city. And this is a, a, a speculative um, drawing, um, it's available on um, uh, futurevenice.org um, which shows how we think that the city of Venice may be transformed by the uh, accretion of a limestone reef underneath, the, reef underneath the city. And essentially what we're doing is we're spreading the point load in this um, project. We're literally taking the stiletto heels off the city so they don't sink into the mud and replacing them with platform wedges. 
So again, the, the, the question comes, you know, so what do these living technologies in an architectural context enable us to do now that we, that we couldn't do before? Well, essentially, a, a new set of design tools and engineering tools are now emerging that really do have a great deal of um, ability to, to cope with these um, uh, changing situations which can adapt and respond to their environment. In the next 10 years we think that um, the, the protocells will actually become autonomous which will coincide with um, you know, the production of methanol say with the um, uh, creation of the, the carbonate skins. And so we now can start really engineering um, you know, uh, shells for the outside of buildings which don't just um, create um, greater insulation for the um, buildings themselves, but can also start to accrete carbon dioxide. Um, and, and so these are the new kinds of strategies that, that we're hoping to share with designers, engineers, architects, and we're really engaging in an interdisciplinary practice where the architect isn't the central um, uh, kind of player in, in orchestrating these projects. They, they really do come from a, a very uh, multidisciplinary perspective. And hopefully we'll um, see much more creativity in terms of ways of dealing with climate change. And, and ways that can really invite us to participate rather than dictate to us what our energy conserving puritanical recycling activity should be. <coughs> Um, and, and, and give us a portfolio of tools where collectively we can actually um, create a diversity of strategies, much like speciation within the animal kingdom and in, in the plant kingdom, um, that will take us forward into the 21st century and with, with an optimism that, that, that we can survive. And not only that, that in an architectural context, that our buildings are not only um, our first lines of defence against a changing world, but perhaps could also become our best friends too. Thank you very much, and I'm very welcome to have questions.